Greetings and welcome to The Vortex. I'm your host, Daniel Allen Jones, and I'm very honored to be here with Maria Meek. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's great to have you here in Jefferson, Texas, where it's known as the Bigfoot capital of Texas, here within Marion County, which has just been declared a safe haven for Bigfoot. It's really interesting to see the variety of, of things that we can have at an event like this here at the Texas Bigfoot Conference, which we hold annually. And we're very honored to be able to bring you in here to discuss some of the work that you've done in the process of discovery. And this is kind of an interesting part of, I think, where the science comes together to meet this legendary idea of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, all of these fantastic things. So please tell a little bit about what your background in conventional sciences has helped to lend when it comes to this idea, this legendary creature of Bigfoot. So I basically lead the expeditions like I do any other scientific expedition, right? I'm looking for physical evidence. I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to use the exact same methodology that I've used in the past, uh, whether it be with great apes or, or lemurs or any sort of uh, primate, uh, the tracking that goes on in that situation, same, same skills applied. Um, I was very fortunate during one of my expeditions in Madagascar to actually be able to discover a brand new species. So I'm very familiar with the process. I've dedicated mostly my, my entire life to uh, searching for very rare elusive animals, some of which had never been studied and many of which had never even been photographed. So while the, the Bigfoot is in right now in that, that realm of legend, my hope is to bring it into the scientific uh, the textbooks that are science. I think that's great. And you also have a big part to play in this great show, Expedition Bigfoot, as um, a science communicator. And I think it's really important that people can see whether they're just basic surface level enthusiasts or they're diehard researchers. Um, can you speak to the effectiveness of what a show like that can do to help reach out into society and sort of plant the seeds in, in people's mm -hmm. minds that maybe there's something to this? Well, it's funny because I never thought of Bigfoot as a vehicle for science communication. And I see more and more by the, the, the letters that I get or the messages on Instagram that I get that it's inspiring people to want to go out there and want to search for themselves and explore. And I am a huge fan of what I call muddy boots research, right? Being out there in the field, spending the time out in nature. That's when discoveries are made. Um, but most importantly, with a platform like Expedition Bigfoot, which is on a major network like Discovery, is that it starts to become a little bit more mainstream in conversation and in, in, in society and in science. And the idea that perhaps we can, you know, lessen the stigma surrounding witness stories, right, who might be ridiculed for sharing their Bigfoot encounters it'll encourage people to want to tell their story and that is going to help you know researchers really move that needle i think it's important to see that there's a supportive network of, of people uh, within the community Definitely. of those who are uh, in involved with bigfoot research and, and are attempting to give people you know information about how they can submit reports because it makes us wonder how many people out there have had an encounter or an yeah. experience that never really get to share it with anyone because of the ridicule factor and things like that but fortunately for us being here in the bigfoot capital of texas we have jeff he's here with us so i'm really excited to be able to finally say we're here with him. He's real. He's the real deal. We have something that we can actually bring to people and show. So let's say and have some fun and say maybe after the fact that we can come across not just speculative um, things that are anecdotal, but we have irrefutable evidence to show the rest of the world. And in your presentation, you gave a really good uh, summation of how it's not just a singular issue. We have to, uh, there's redundancy involved. There's a lot that has to go into actually providing evidence to make it more substantial. But in the event that we do come across something that's irrefutable, we're here with them, a type specimen, hopefully living, hopefully a community of them. I'm particularly interested in the anthropological aspects of what we can learn. Um, what are your thoughts on the possibility that something to the effect of uh, um, enculturation could be at play or the idea is that maybe there could be a intelligible, uh, intelligible language that maybe that's being used forms of communication. Any particular thoughts on how that might work? Well, I mean, I always reference the animal kingdom for that, right? And we see examples over and over and over of animals that are using language. And even from the most primitive forms like a lemur, for example, they're using multiple different kinds of calls to mean very specific things. And then you work your way all the way up to like, say, Coco the gorilla, who actually learned sign language, but within their natural habitats and communities, 
these animals are communicating with each other and we see that in dolphins with elephants and we're learning more and more about that so it's not out of the realm of possibility that if you're dealing with something that is either you know um ape-like or, or hominid that they're going to have some sort of uh way to communicate and perhaps that includes language do you think it would be possible in the event that once we get to the point of showing they are here, they're real, um, and, and we are, are a part of the world that they exist within, uh, that maybe some conservancy would go into place? Or what do you think the, well, the after effects to, would be? Well, right? And, and that's one of the challenges. I'm a conservationist, and I work with very endangered animals. And one of the risks that you take by finding these animals is that now you're exposing them to the world. And more than that, you're getting them to trust humans, right? Because we're there in, in good faith to study them and to learn more about them and actually to help protect them. But not everyone is of that like mind. So you're maybe introducing poachers into an area or hunters that now know where to go find these animals. So you have to have um, the infrastructure in place to protect an animal, especially if you're going to come out and say, I've discovered something, especially something that, you know, is kind of taking over pop culture and everyone is so interested in. You have to first, before making, let's say, such an announcement, um, take the necessary steps to make sure that they're protected after that. I think it's important to see that the steps beyond discovery to declaration are not always instantaneous and that there's a lot that could be no, done. No, there's a lot of time that goes into that. I mean, I, I, I sort of knew we had discovered a new species, but you can't just make that announcement. There are so many steps that go from that point of you suspect you've got a new species or even you know to proving it and to really make it um, part of the science, right? Uh, part of, sorry, <laughs> you know, having it, it accepted in, in, in peer reviewed journals. And, and that usually takes multiple lines of evidence, but it also takes quite a lot of time. Well, uh, you're also very close with someone who's had a very reputable background in primatology. Um, and of course, as you mentioned in your talk, Jane Goodall has uh, been somewhat of a proponent. What are your thoughts on how someone like that can help give credence to this otherwise very challenging area of research? Well, I think that it helps to lessen that stigma that we talked about. I think having someone like Dr. Goodall come out and say, I think it's entirely possible. I've had a lot of eyewitness accounts that I truly believe these were honest people. Some of them are Native Americans. Even in Ecuador, she had um, multiple sources tell her and describe what sounds like a Bigfoot, or at least that's the, the descriptions that um, that we hear here in, in North America. And so to have somebody with her, her platform, her gravitas and her level of expertise is, is I think something very positive for the Bigfoot community. But the thing to keep in mind is, you know, Jane is, you know, Jane is a trailblazer. When Jane first started working with chimpanzees, she was ridiculed because she was naming the animals. And that was something that was unheard of. It wasn't scientific. You, you numbered them. That was it. You didn't name them. And she's gone on to prove that these animals are smart, sentient beings, right? That, that now it's not an, um, an odd thing to name animal, study animals. So I think that science has a, a traditional way of thinking. And once you uh, push through those barriers, um, then it opens a lot of doors. There's a lot of skepticism, of course, when it comes to this, not just by way of curiosity, but outright uh, disregarding and, and denying that maybe there's something to this. What would you say to those of the mindset that this is all imaginative or nonsense and that there's really nothing to it? Um, what I would say is that science itself is based on curiosity and wonder and asking the questions and, you know, not having evidence that something exists is improving that something doesn't exist. So if, if people want to go out there and, and search for it and you're getting all of these reports, even if all of them are, are either misidentifications or hoaxes, all you need is for one of them to be true to make that pursuit worthwhile. I think it's going to be something that more people are going to be aware of thanks to the shows that you're involved with and the work that you're presenting to very large audiences that sometimes conferences, books, and, and other things really can't reach. So what would you say to those as a send-off for people and maybe young minds who are interested, who are compassionate about uh, wildlife and just wanting to be able to see what they can do to get involved? What would you say to those who are interested? Well, all it takes is one person, right? So why can't that be you sitting out there thinking, oh, I might want to do this or, you know, a young person who has that curiosity and that sense of wonder and, and the sense of adventure to go out there and, and, and really go in search of it. 
um, I say go go out into nature. I mean, that's where things are going to happen. That's where you're going to find your experiences and, and have a chance to actually discover something like this. I think it would be amazing. It's, it's really uh, exciting and inspiring the work that you're doing. So for those who are interested in following up with what you're involved with, where they can uh, go to find out more. Sure. So I have a website. It's www.mireyamayor.com. And I'm also uh, pretty active on Instagram. So you can follow my adventures there. And that's just at Maria Mayer. Awesome. I like to think that we're making new discoveries every day and that we won't know if we don't go. And you're that's doing it. just that. It's really exciting to see all the things that are possible whenever you share the work that you've done. So, Maria, it's been an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. I hope that we can eventually <laughs> be here with the real one here that at some point. That would be point. phenomenal. It's something I think everyone's anticipating. <laughs> so I appreciate goal. that. And we'll Thank see you, you guys in the Vortex.